Hello Interwebs, welcome to Let's Fix Computers. Today I'm going to show you guys um, uh, one of my new toys that I've uh, received recently from Pine64. Uh, this, is not a this is not a sponsored video, uh, nor is it an official review. I just saw this, thought it was neat, and bought one with my own money. Um, a chap in my Discord, uh, link in the description down below, um, linked in the Pine64 Pine Cell and said, hey, this is a cheap TS100 style soldering iron, which is open source and well priced. Uh, and I looked at it and I was like, that's kind of neat. I'm going to buy one of those and try it out. So I've got one here to test out and I'm going to show it off to you. I also bought at the same time the Pine64 Pine Power desktop. Um, so this is a five channel USB power supply. Um, now there's uh, a bit to talk about with this thing and its various features, but not enough for a dedicated video of its own. So I'm just going to do a very flying overview of this thing. It's got quick charge three, triple five volt outputs, and power delivery 65 watts, type C. And you'll see why this guy is relevant in a moment when we get to the, uh, the pine cell. And on top of that, it's also got 10 watt Qi charging on top of it as well. So you've got pretty much every standard of USB charging in, currently in existence in a single box that sits on your desk. This guy's got up to 120 watts of output. So you can load down all of these ports at the same time which is really cool because a lot of these chargers, they don't like having everything on fire at the same time, which to my op opinion kind of defies the point of them, but whatever. At any rate, this guy's really cool. As you can see, it's got voltage and amperage reporting on the front of it as well. So you can see what each of the ports is doing. The Quick Charge 3 one, this is dynamically updating. It will tell you what voltage that Quick Charge has negotiated, which is typically going to be five volts or nine volts. Um, then also the power delivery port, that's sitting on zero at the moment because it's off. But as soon as you plug something into that, that will also negotiate 5, 9, 15 or 20 volts output at various amperages. And so it's really cool that you can plug something in and it tells you exactly what voltage it's negotiated, which is really handy. The middle ones, unfortunately, although they show amperage, the voltage is static on these. Um, I've tried loading this down to the point where the voltage starts to sag, which was around three and a half amps. Yeah, I know, quite a lot, right? Um, and the voltage display did not go down, even though the port was down to like four and a half volts. But these are basic five volt USB outputs, so no one really cares about that. You're only going to be powering basic stuff from those. Any high power stuff where it's really relevant, you're going to have on your quick charge port or your power delivery port. It does also have this little battery bar gauge. However, that's a bit of a novelty. It animates when there's power flowing, but it doesn't actually tell you if the device is charged or not. Um, so it's a bit of a gimmick and I don't really think actually needs to be there. It doesn't give you useful information basically, um, but whatever, it's there. It shows you that something is happening, but the, you can see that from the amperage anyway. So make of that what you will. Anyway, I'm going to be using this Pine Power desktop to power the Pine Sill. So this is an electronic soldering iron. And for those of you who haven't seen one, it's very similar to the Miniware TS100. And this is the soldering iron that I actually use as my daily driver. Um, so this is a 65 watt iron. And the reason why these are interesting is that it's a very portable soldering iron. Instead of having a big box that sits on the counter, you've got all your temperature controls and sleep controls and idle and all the rest of it is built into the actual handle itself. Um, and you power it just through a barrel jack connector. And that accepts a DC voltage from 12 to 24 volts. There's a micro USB port there as well, but that's just for firmware programming. So this guy is interesting because you can power it from basically whatever you've got lying around. Uh, I typically run mine on a 65 watt laptop charger. Uh, this is 19 and a half volts, 3.42 amps, so 65 watts. And that powers one of these really nicely. It's the same connector that a Toshiba laptop uses. So Toshiba laptop charger, perfect for powering one of these, very convenient. But in addition to that, you can also use other cables which you can either buy or make up yourself as I've done. Here's an XT60 to barrel jack cable, which now means I can plug in LiPo batteries. So you can connect a, a three cell uh, battery, which is obviously a nominal um, up to 12 volts or so, um, but a little bit on the low side. Four cell is better, that puts you at around 15. Um, or you could also plug in a five cell 
for, I think, about 21 volts. And 6-cell is also possible, but 6-cell is pushing it a bit. You want to be a little bit careful on that front. So you can run your, your electronic soldering iron on just portable LiPo batteries, which makes it a portable soldering iron that you can use in the middle of a field. Then uh, additionally for that, you could also use other custom cables. I've got an XT60 to banana jack here. So that means that I can now plug these two together. And now I can power this soldering iron from my bench power supply. Also very cool. So the idea of these, these uh, electronic soldering irons is that you can power them from whatever you've got lying around. Um, now, what makes the pine still interesting is it also has the same barrel jack on the back so it's got all the power input options that the TS100 has, but it's got type C on it. And that type C will accept 60 watts power delivery. So um, where the TS100 cannot be powered from a just a standard type C power bank, the pine sill, you can just plug this into your basic Amazon Anker power bank that's got type C power delivery on it. Really cool. Um, so the Miniware also make a TS80 that can do this party trick, but the TS80 doesn't have the barrel jack and it's quite a low wattage. So there's lots of people that battle it out over whether the TS80 or the TS100 is, is superior. Um, and here's the interesting thing. I prefer the TS100, but the pine saw with type C and a barrel jack on it and 60 watts does everything. So this guy solves the dilemma of TS80 versus TS100 by being the best of both worlds. So it also takes exactly the same tips that the TS100 takes. So we've got in-tip heating elements here, which are the superior type. And we slot that guy in there, tighten the screw, and now we've got a full soldering iron ready to go that just fits in the tip of your hands. So um, I can plug this into uh, my current charger here and when I turn it on it immediately gives me the display and it shows 19 on the side indicating 19 volts um, uh, mains power input. Um, however what I'll do just to show you that party trick I will plug in my pine power desktop. So if I plug this guy in now as you can see the power delivery point has now negotiated 20 volts So that has now given us 20 volts input on here, which is the maximum um, power input. This guy goes up to 21, so 20 volts is your, is your ideal max. And now we've got a type C 60 watt soldering iron. Very cool. Um, so what we'll do now is I'll give you a very quick flying tour of the menus in here, because this is the other thing I like about this device, is it's got a much better menu system than the TS100 has. And then what I've got, I've got a tiny little practice kit here and we'll solder something together with it. Now for the sake of comparison, I'll just show you what the TS100 menus look like because that gives you an idea of where we're coming from here. If I press the button on there, um, we get information. And if I press this button, we start going through the menu options. We've got Wook Temp, Stub Temp, Slip Time. We've got Idle Time. We've got temp stup. And you see where I'm going with this. Now, this is probably like temp stop. I, I don't know what that is. Uh, let's go through that one more time. Battery reset is easier. WK temp working temperature, I guess. Uh, standby. Oh, yeah. Standby temperature and sleep time. So when it goes to sleep and so on. But it's got these abbreviated, uh, these abbreviated menu items that and it's just like, it's difficult to read, man. Like, it's in there, and I'm being deliberately obtuse here, but you see what I mean? It's suffering from small screen syndrome. By comparison, have a look at what the menus on the uh, on the pine sill look like. We uh, So we'll click button number, uh, the minus button here to go into the, uh, as you can see, we've got a config menu here, which immediately tells you what the button is doing. So if we press that, we've got power source, QC voltage, and as you can see, this one has been adjusted, so it actually shows us soldering settings, sleep modes, user interface. It's categorized and it's clearer. So if we go into that again, let's go to uh, QC voltage, let's go into soldering settings. Boost temp, okay, what is boost temp? I'll just wait. And hey, it tells me. 
temperature when in boost mode. Cool. OK, so, OK, auto start. What is auto start? Automatically starts the iron into soldering on power up. Cool. So there we go. We can switch it on. So as soon as I turn it on, it immediately starts heating. So the great thing about this menu is it's got these tool tips that tell you what this is. Temp change short. What is that? Temperature change steps on short button press. Cool. So if I press a short button press, it changes the temperature increment in one degree increments. So we could change that to be two or five degree increments because we don't need that amount of fine control. Rad. OK. Um, so as you can see, we can go through these settings and it tells us what these things are. So we go into sleep mode, sleep timer. OK, well, what's sleep temp? Oh, sleep temp. What's sleep temp? So sleep temperature. OK, that's fine. That's fairly self-explanatory. It's the temperature when it's in sleep mode, isn't it? OK. Sleep timeout. OK, so 50S. Sleep timeout. So minutes or seconds. So that's how long until it goes into sleep timeout. So as you can see, the menu on this one is so much more intuitive. Now, it bears mention, I've never done a firmware update on my TS100. Uh, it's, there's a possibility that someone out there is going to turn around and say, oh, you can get an updated firmware for the TS100 that does all of this. But I don't know. I don't have that. I didn't need to get that for this one. This is really clear and intuitive out the box, and I like that a lot. So I won't go through all of the settings because we'll be here all day. There's lots in there, but you can explore these and you can explore them to your heart's content and set it up just how you like. So then finally, if I press the plus button, we'll start heating. So I'll show you a quick, quick comparison. Um, so uh, I'm not going to do a race between this and the TS100. They're about the same, mainly because they're using more or less the same tips on them. But just to get a rough idea on how quickly an iron like this heats up, um, this is obviously at 20 volts, 60 watt mode. So let's hit the chart. Let's hit the heat button. So that's the kind of heating time that you can expect from this. You know, there's going to be big, heavy duty um, uh, professional soldering irons that can probably heat quicker. However, as you can see, that was maybe 10, maybe 10 or 20 seconds to heat up. I've got it set to 370 at the moment. And what I can do, I can press, I can do a short press to go up in five degree increments, just like we did in the menu settings there. And the iron will go, will allow me to go up to 450. However, I know that the tip can't do 450. The tips actually top out at about 410 or so. So I'm going to leave mine at 380, just so as not to run my tips ragged. So there we go. But another thing it has is we can also long press for boost. So if you're pressing the iron against a big ground plane and you're struggling, you can be like, I need more heat, boost. And you can hold that down and it's boosting and it's basically just going as high as it can go for a sec. And then we release it and it comes back down to 380. Now, I don't think the TS100 has a boost mode. So that's a nifty little trick that I can think of plenty of occasions where that would be useful. Because most of the time, 380 or even 350 is probably fine. It's just every now and then you go up against a ground plane and you need a bit of extra power. So that's really handy. Another thing that's useful is you can also drill into the menu on this and you can have, at the moment, as you can see, we've got a big temperature readout and 20 for 20 volts. But you can also set this into detail view where it will show you what power mode it's in and also it will show you the sleep timer. So you can see the countdown timer until the iron goes into sleep mode. So if, if, you're a, if you're a stats nerd and you want to see lots of statistics on the screen, you can have that too. Personally, I don't think that information is useful all the time. I know what power mode it's in. I know what the sleep timer is at. I just want to see the temperature just so I can see at a glance if it's heated up or not. So that's that. So yeah, that's really cool and I like it. Um, so what I'll do now, we'll break out this kit and I'll solder this kit together for you. We'll probably do it partly in fast forward but it just shows you what this thing looks like in action um, and uh, gives me something to solder together. And there's quite a few people who have watched my content and are buying soldering equipment at the moment. Um, and they're not really sure where to start. 
And so uh, the re other reason why I want to get this kit out is to say you can buy soldering kits like this um, from Banggood.com, from AliExpress, from various other import websites. You can buy them for a couple of quid each, a few dollars. Small practice kits, they can be like, you know, four dollars plus two dollars delivery anywhere in the world or something like that. And these are a great way to practice because they give you something to solder together, basically. And they make a weird little widget. So this is going to be a little heart of LEDs. So this is going to show my appreciation for these Pine64 products that I've bought. Let's see if I can figure this out in one go. So as you can see, we've got all the labels on one side for what components go where. So we've got 47K resistors and a 10K resistor and so on. And on the other side, we've got soldering pads. So I'll put this thing together now with my Pine64 soldering iron, which incidentally has gone to sleep over here. So, ooh, there you go. That's what it looks like in sleep mode. You can just see it going Z, 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 and it's just cooling down of its own accord. Right, so this is now a kit building video from here on out. So since I'm showing off equipment, and since I can't, I don't have an affiliate link for the uh, Pine64 gear, however, I do have an affiliate link for this Anang AN8008 multimeter, which I shall use to discover which resistors of these are which values. Um, if, you're a, uh, if you're an expert electronics nerd, you can learn your color codes. However, for me, I think it's a lot easier just to use a multimeter personally. So I'm gonna switch my multimeter into resistance mode and we'll just figure out which ones of these are which. There we go, so there's a 100K resistor, 100K. There's a 22 ohm. That's a 10K, 9.8. And these boys over here are 46K. So that'll be 47 to be, to, to be precise, plus tolerance. So those are the 47s. So now we've identified what components we are, or we have, we can load up the board. So I'll start by bending the legs of these resistors. And I'll just slot those into the board. It's not terribly good practice to fold the legs over like this, but it's only a kit, so who cares? If you're building something serious, you shouldn't really do this, and you should have some kind of uh, holder for your, for your kit. However, small kits like this, yeah, you'll be all right. There's my 10K. There's my 22 ohm. And let's get those soldered on. So for this kit, because we're not exactly soldering a, um, we're not exactly soldering a laptop motherboard here. So I'm gonna drop my iron temp to 340 degrees, just simply because we don't need to roast the iron for this. It's only a small kit. So we're gonna run a slightly lower temperature. I'll take my spool of solder. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to press the iron against the edge of the leg and then just feed some solder into it. Like that, there we go. And rinse and repeat. Press the iron against the leg, feed some solder into it. There we go. And we're just gonna do that for all of these legs here. And every now and then you'll start noticing that you get slag and clag and grossness building up on the tip of the iron. So when that happens, Take your wet sponge or your scour pad or whatever you have and just clean the tip off a little bit. And now we have a nice shiny tip again. Some people do that after every operation. I think that's a bit overkill. But, you know, there are some people who've been in this business for decades and know more about soldering than I do. However, one of the nice things about this soldering iron is that these tips are ten dollars or so to replace so if you ruin a tip on this iron it's not the end of the world you can just buy a new one that's why i'm not heartbroken about some of my other soldering iron tips that are a bit ruined because uh, when they wear out you can just replace them 
They don't cost hundreds of dollars. There we go. Now I'll take these trimmers and I'll just trim off the legs. And we've soldered some resistors onto our board. So now I'll do the rest of the resistors and I'll also add in this electrolytic capacitor and also this transistor that we've got here as well. So I'll put all of those on next. Oh, I've gone a bit wrong. Don't forget to turn the device around to make it work for you. <clears throat> you can get little holders to hold the board in place as well. I do actually have some helping hands. However, I notoriously never use them unless I absolutely need them. I have made such a hash up of that. Look at that big old bridge. That's terrible, man. So as you can see, I've made a complete mashup of that one, but that's okay, we can clean that up. So what I shall do, I shall clean the tip of the soldering iron, so there's nothing on the soldering iron, and we'll just bring that solder up. There we go. We're gonna trim those legs off anyway, so it doesn't matter. I've just brought the solder away from the base, and now let's just get a proper connection down there. There we go. I'll just get my resistors and then we'll trim all those legs off. we go, there's our solder pads, there's our components. I'll put this trimmer pot on next, I think. Ah, the power switch doesn't stay in of its own accord, so we'll just rest that there. So the way to deal with this guy is I'll solder just one leg Ah, very jankly, I might add. And now I'll press into it with my thumb. And while I'm pressing on the button, I'll just reflow that join. There we go. So now we know, because I'm pressing on it, that it's definitely flat against the board. There we go. No idea what the trimmer pot does. We'll find out. I don't even know what this does. It lights up. That's all I know. And finally, we've got a chip here. It's an ONS W93M uh, LM358P, I suspect is the correct answer there. There we go. That's all our basic components. Now we've just got to put some LEDs on this thing. So the LEDs <clears throat> have a flat side on them. Let's see. Can we see that? There it is. You can just see on camera there we've got a flat side. Let's go for the super close up. There you go. So there's our flat side on the LED. It's at the top of the LED is flat. And that corresponds 
to the flats that we're seeing on the board there. So I'll load these up a couple at a time. I don't think I'm going to go full mad lad and do them all in one go. Although they do click in with a very satisfying click. Another giveaway to where the flat side is, is um, the flat side, which is the um, uh, anode. No, the flat side is the cathode, the, the negative pin, and that has a shorter leg. The anode, the positive pin, has a long leg on it. I think I will do these five at a time. So we're going to have a job getting these uh, LEDs to be all straight. And we want them to be all straight because if they're all wonky, when it lights up, it'll look weird. So I'm just going to solder one leg on each of these and we're going to do the same trick that we did um, with the switch. So we'll just solder one leg and then we'll go around each of them and make sure they're flat. And if you've only soldered one leg, it's easy to reflow. Once you've soldered both the legs, it's difficult to reflow. Not impossible, just harder. So as you can see, they're all wonky and all over the place at the moment. So let's fix that. So press the LED, reflow. Press the LED, reflow. Lovely and straight now. Beautiful. Uh, I'm blobbing. Solder will always flow to where the heat is. So if you don't get the heat onto the board, the uh, solder will just flow onto the iron instead. There we go. These kits have notoriously small solder pads on them. Ah, which makes it really difficult to actually get the heat down. This would be easier with a chisel tip. And this is where the weakness of this point tip comes in. The TS100 as standard comes with the, uh, the TS D24 tip, which as you can see is a wedge. And it's easier to press that down against the board. However, for the sake of this review video, I will use the tip that came with it. However, uh, just to let you know, as soon as this video is done, I'm going to pull this tip out and put my D24 in it. So <laughs> that gives you an idea. The tip here is serviceable. It's completely usable as I'm demonstrating. You can use it. However, it's not the best. They should have shipped it with a, um, with a wedge tip. Most soldering irons tend to come with uh, the cone tip, and I don't know why, because I've yet to meet anyone who likes the cone tip in preference to anything else. Like when you get into the realm of knife edge tips and stuff like that, different people have got different preferences. However, everyone universally agrees that no one likes the, the, the cone tip. I'm sure it's got a use somewhere, but I don't like it. Oh, blimey. I bent these LEDs up a tree. It's a good thing we're fixing this as we go. A loop. Went a bit wonky on that last one. Have we got enough solder on that? Yep, that's fine. Incidentally, these, uh, these side cutters I'm using, these are called flush cutters. And you can buy them very cheaply on eBay or probably Amazon. And if you want some tomorrow, then you can probably buy a pair for, I don't know, five pounds couple, you know, $5 or so on eBay or Amazon, and you can have them next day tomorrow. But what I would do is these things can get blunted and broken. Like these ones, this is my NAF pair. And as you can see, the tip on that is NAF. The tips are completely blunt on the very end there. Um, so the trick is, is if you want some tomorrow, then buy a pair on Amazon or eBay in your country so you get them within a day. 
But then at the same time, jump on eBay and get them from a Chinese seller for half the price for about two pounds or $2.50 a pair and put like two or three pairs on order for less than 10 bucks. And sure, they'll take three or four weeks to arrive. However, it means you'll have spares. So when you break a pair, you just take another pair out the drawer. Okay, right, this is complete. So now we've just got to power it from something. It accepts DC four to six volts. So that's just a little bit too high to power it off of a single LiPo cell. I've got these really adorable dinky little LiPo cells here, which would be perfect for powering this because you could just tape it to the back or something like that. However, even at full charge, this thing is only 4.2 volts. Um, and the problem is that's probably gonna dip just a little bit too low to drive the chip on this thing. So uh, that's no good to me. Uh, and six volts is also a little bit too low to put two of them in series as well. So ideally what I need is, um, uh, I need just a five volt, uh, five volt USB supply or something like that. Um, so I could, I could hook in a USB wire to this, but I don't have one to hand. So that's no good to me either. Uh, so what I'll do for now is I'm gonna grab some jumper wires and we'll just power this from my DC bench power supply. So let me just grab a couple of wires. Right, positive on the right, negative on the left. There we go. Now we've got a little power lead. I shall plug that in there. And I'll connect the other end of this up to my DC power supply. Right, and I'll set my DC power supply to five volts and three amps. It doesn't need three amps, but it's not gonna use any more than that. So we're now outputting five volts. And if I push the power button, ooh, there we go. It's doing a thing. And as you can see, it momentarily bursts a little bit of current and then it goes out again as it gets brighter and dimmer. So uh, I assume that the trimmer pot just increases or decreases the speed of it. Uh, screwdriver. Oh no, my magnet has picked up all of the loose wires. So what happens if we go that way? There we go, we can just get little pulses from it now. And if we go up to there, We get long, strong pulses. There you go. Have a green heart, everyone. There we have it, everyone. That was my review of the Pine 64 Pine Sill. So it's a really nice electronic soldering iron. Now, I used it to make this, um, this simple little LED flashing kit here. However, from past experience of using the TS100, you could absolutely use this to solder motherboards. Um, I, there's not a doubt in my mind. Um, now, a lot of people are purist about soldering irons and be like, well, if you want to do professional salt board repair, you're going to need to get yourself a Hacko or a Weller or a JVC um, or, or something like that. And absolutely, all of those brands are very, very good brands of soldering iron and will also do you proud. However, they're also very expensive. And I'm not saying that expensive is bad. You know, they'll be worth the money. Uh, there's plenty of devices that I have upgraded in my toolkit as of late that are more expensive than the ones that I started out with. However, if you just want to get into soldering and you just want to start out, then you can pick up one of these for not a lot of money and you'll find that it is perfectly adequate for everything you want to do right up until the point where you go professional. And when you start earning decent money from it, you can buy yourself that Hacko or Weller or JVC. Um, and it's worth bearing in mind that I do work, do this professionally. Now, I don't do board repair every single day. There are other YouTube channels out there that do this all day, every day. And for them, absolutely, they're probably gonna want the more exotic irons. But for me, these little electronic soldering irons, perfectly up to the job for occasional use on heavy duty stuff and regular use on simple hobbyist stuff. So thank you very much for watching everyone. Uh, my support links for my Patreon, my Discord and my uh, Twitter are in the description down below or stick around for the end card. 
Uh, and also, uh, in case you like what you see, uh, I'll stick a, um, uh, a Amazon affiliate link for this um, uh, Anning AN008 multimeter in the description down below, uh, because it's a decent little starter multimeter. One of those, a soldering iron, some solder, and you're ready to go, basically. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.